Hey everybody, it is good to be with you today at Vineyard Columbus. My name is Julia Pickerel and I'm here with... Santos, how y'all doing? <laughs> it's good to be here with you. Again, Absolutely. we did this a couple of weeks ago, didn't we? We did, and we're a good team. I know, yeah. I like it. Now, a couple of weeks ago when we were here, I mentioned that Santos has a pretty exciting thing happening in life. And we're actually recording this a little bit ahead of when it's being viewed. Yep. But for those of you who are watching right now, Guess who's getting married this weekend? Literally right now. I don't know if, <laughs> am I the one who's walking down the aisle or no? Hannah's walking down the aisle, but. It's virtual, right? Right, Are it's gonna, gonna be virtual. A, vir a virtual aisle? We're gonna have like, uh, we're gonna be like in a studio space. There's gonna be bridal party. And then all of our audience is gonna be online through Zoom. That's so really exciting. We found a way to like hook up like a professional camera and a microphone okay. and it's gonna be like a really cool experience for everybody. That's great. So we all get to celebrate <sighs> yes. what, uh, in the midst of crazy times, something really fun in your life. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> and uh, isn't it like, are you close to your anniversary or something like that? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So Eric and I decided when we, uh, when we were young and free that we would get married on New Year's Eve. Because there's go. always a party. Yeah. Or there's always a need to have a party. Or people think they know what they're going to do for New Year's Eve. Exactly. But they really and don't have a good plan. You end up at home and you're like, I'm so bored. So we always have a great thing to celebrate. Yeah. We're actually heading towards 27 years. Congratulations. 27 years. That's awesome. Thanks. Okay, so I, I got to ask you, right? <laughs> I'm about to get married. I'm getting married today. Yep. Congratulations to me and Hannah. It's awesome. But... <laughs> What, okay, like there's got to be some insane story. Oh, yeah. Two young people getting married. Oh, yeah. Tell me all about yeah, it. Yeah, we were babies. We were babies. And we did student ministry together. So like you work with students, we worked with students, which was super fun. So the first year of our wow. marriage, I was still in college. Uh, we were doing youth ministry. We were working at a church and we were actually renovating a house. So we bought this completely empty farmhouse. Well, it wasn't empty. Yeah. It was not lived in except for by large families of animals. So are we like abandoned or? <laughs> like if you never went back to your house yeah. three years later. So it was just this interesting. It was the only way we could buy a house. It was really cheap. There you go. Hey, the <laughs> price is right. But we renovated this place with the help of high school students. So we had high school students on the roof. We had high school students digging out the foundation with us, <laughs> setting up animal traps, catching and releasing raccoons. And at one point we got woken up at like five in the morning by a high school kid uh, revving up a chainsaw, cutting some trees down. Yep. He so thought it would you be had fun. all the parent waivers you needed well, for this project? Of, it or? was before everyone was super worried about liability. I'm very old. And so back in the day, everyone was like, kids, chainsaws, go for it. Why not? Exactly. <laughs> That's so you've, where, got, uh, you've got years of adventure ahead of you. Okay. That was only our one, our first year. It's it's just been even more since then. Oh my gosh, that's insane. Mm -hmm. And then like, can you think about like the weirdest gift that you ever got that wasn't on a registry? Oh my gosh. Yeah, I, I actually remember. So again, we when <laughs> when I was married, Eric had long locks. He had beautiful, long, curly red yes. hair. Yes. And I still remember when we registered, because back in the olden days, you would go to like, I think Lazarus and register. And at one point, the salesperson referred to him as lady oh, from the no. back because he had his long hair. <laughs> Oh, and so we registered for all this stuff. We didn't know what we needed, and we were super overwhelmed and really stressed. But one of the things that we got when we were opening our wedding gifts, I was 21. We were renovating a farmhouse, and somebody got us a really expensive crystal uh, basket-shaped candy dish. So exactly like a okay. like a little like it was in the shape of a basket, but it was crystal and it was worth like <laughs> three hundred bucks. Oh my gosh! I know, I know. Yeah, I know. So we tried to return it because we were young and cheap and needed money more than we needed. And then you basket. put candy in it, so yeah, it's not yeah. you know it's like like at your grandma's house you'd be like. That's super legit. That's it. Mm -hmm. Wow. That is, that's, shout out to the person who ever did that. That's, that's <laughs> nice. Know, somebody who loved us well. Yeah. I, I wish for you wonderful and exciting um, wedding gifts. And hopefully a crystal basket. Maybe that's what I'll get him. <laughs> no, I have another idea. Yeah. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's funny. And when, when you said the, you know, kids and chainsaws it made me think about like our men's event a while ago the Chilean chainsaws oh yeah yeah they stole that idea from 
maybe what happened back then exactly. with the student. Exactly. <laughs> Every good idea began Children like in Children and Chainsaws. <laughs> yeah, <sorry. laughs> you should start that. <laughs> oh, my God. Yeah. It's great. I won't work here long if I do that. <laughs> Well, not in these days. <laughs> back yeah. in the day, maybe. We were really excited for you. One of the yeah. things that was always important for Eric and I when we first got married, we were young and foolish, but we knew enough to know that if we... Um, if we did first things first, mm -hmm. we look first to the kingdom of God, everything else, everything else gets added. And that's, the, that's my prayer for you and Hannah, that you guys would mm -hmm. always be looking for and toward and pursuing the kingdom of God, that you would know that everything good is added after mm -hmm. that. The Lord, will, the Lord will care for you as you seek him and serve him. That's so good. I'm, I'm going to hold to that. Yeah. that that's important. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm really excited. And I think it's like a, you know, a transition, a moment mm -hmm. of like, we can set some new rhythms here as we're getting married and it's just special. It's like, you know, my relationship with the Lord, her relationship with the Lord, and then mm -hmm. us coming together, like, what is that going to look like, yeah. you know? It's a good thing. Mm. It's a good thing. Well, we're happy for you. And, yeah. you know, I think it's time. We're going to get started, Vineyard Columbus. If you're just joining us, welcome. Again, my name is Julia Pickerel. I'm our incoming senior pastor. And I'm Santos. I'm the high school pastor here. Listen, it is so good to be with you all today. Listen, it is our heart to connect with you guys during our service. And so we have leaders and pastors on hand ready to connect with you through chat and to pray with you. So go ahead, do yourself a favor and say hello in the chat. Thank you so much for being here with us. We're going to continue our service by entering into a time of worship together. Then we're going to receive the offering. I'm really excited today to hear a message from Pastor Shane Huey. Would you pray with me as we begin to worship? Lord, we come to you now and we say yes to everything that you have for us, Lord. We're grateful for you. Would you draw us to you and worship Jesus? Would you meet each of us where we are, Lord? We love you. Amen. <laughs>
solid ground. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Pick me up and turn me around and replace my feet on the solid ground.
of chaos and in the midst of the unknown that doesn't change of how good you are you continue to be good and so Lord we just give ourselves to you we surrender it all let your will be done in us God we say this in your name Amen, amen. Vineyard Columbus, it is so good to be able to worship together. As you know, we are one church that meets in multiple locations under normal circumstances. And this year is not normal, right? It's, it's insane. And so with that, we are one big church family meeting online. We are so glad that you are here with us. And I'd like to uh, highlight that we are heading into a really exceptionally special time in the life of our church. For the first three weekends of January, we're gonna be celebrating our senior leadership transition. For those three weeks only, we will gather together only on Sunday mornings at nine and 10.30. We're gonna be opening up our services in person. Mm -hmm. And so if you want to be a part of that, go ahead and register at vineyardcolumbus.org. Also, there's limited space, so please get there fast, register. And students, please. We want you there. We want you to be a part of it. Go ahead and register also. I'm going to be looking out for you. We are really excited to begin to gather in person, and we are thrilled that everyone's going to be able to come together safely. Um, we have all sorts of ways that you can partner with us to make this happen. I would love for you to check out our website, vineyardcolumbus.org, at join a team, particularly if you would like to work with our kids. If you wanna be where the action is, the most important place in the church is working with our children. We would love to have you volunteer. Again, please check out that website, sign up so that you can be a part of helping this church relaunch this year. That's right, and you, you will not regret that decision. We need your help. We do. If you are just joining us here for the first or second time, we would love to get more connected with you. It's really easy to do that. Grab your phone, text the word hi, to the number 98977. Yes, it's that easy. Just go ahead and text hi to 98977. And what we'll do is you'll receive a digital connect card that is gonna give you four different options of amazing community organizations that are doing help in our city. And we're gonna donate a special $5 gift in your name. And so you'll go ahead and text hi and you'll receive that digital connect card. I'm gonna turn our attention now to a time of taking our offering you have been an incredibly generous church in an incredibly difficult year, mm -hmm. and we are incredibly grateful. I want you to know what our prayer for you is this year. It's actually out of the book of Romans, chapter 15, 13. We're praying for you that the God of hope would fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks for your continued generosity. And it's so easy to give, really simple. All you have to do is text the word GIVE to 98977. And just a reminder, for the end of year giving, if you wanna be able to make sure that you have that in, so we receive it, and then it's also postmarked by December 31st. And so uh, we're incredibly grateful for the way that our church continues to be generous and give during such difficult times. And there's been amazing work that's been uh, been able to continue. Ministry's mm -hmm. been able to continue because of your giving. Mm -hmm. and so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to pray for our offering, and then uh, Pastor Shane Douglas Huey is going <laughs> to preach this week's message. So why don't you go ahead and pray with me. God, we thank you so much 
for uh, the opportunity that we have to continue to spread uh, your message of love and truth in our city. Lord, I pray right now that um, you would lead us, that we would be cheerful givers today, Lord. And so God, would you have your way with this offering? We give it to you and we say yes and amen. In heaven name we pray, amen. amen. Yo, what's up, Vineyard Columbus, grace and peace to you guys. Like Santo said, my name is in fact Shane Douglas Huey. My man put my whole government name out there, but it is so good to be with you all. Before we dive into the word today, I'm excited to let you know about our January game plan. Starting Sunday, January 3rd, we're gonna be kicking off a three-week sermon series celebrating our leadership transition. Now, for these three first Sundays in January, there will be no Saturday night service. We just wanna encourage you to check us out again on Sunday at 9 and 10.30. I'm also really pumped to let you know that for those of you who are ready to regather, we're inviting you back into the building starting Sunday, January 17th. Now for that Sunday, only our Cooper Road campus will be open, but the following Sunday, January 24th, all of our campuses as well as VC20 will be open for you to return. Now I can assure you we're handling this as safely as possible. We're gonna be responsive to the mandates uh, coming from Governor DeWine. Your safety is our first concern. Now space is limited and you do have to register. So for uh, more information and to register, you need to secure your spot. Jump online at Vineyard Club org slash welcome back. Now, if you have your Bibles, uh, go with me to Luke chapter 15. Eric and Julia have actually given me the rare treat today of preaching on whatever I feel like. We're usually constrained by the sermon series, but, but I'm just going to preach to you what God has put in my heart. And I can't think of a better thing to preach on uh, coming off what has been for many of you an incredibly difficult 2020. I can't think of a better thing to preach on than the hope that we have in Jesus. A quote that I try to live my life by. All of my VC20 folks have heard me quote this a thousand times. It comes from uh, one of my spiritual heroes, Charles Spurgeon. Spurgeon says this. He says, the motto of all true servants of God must be, we preach Christ and him crucified. A sermon without Christ is like a loaf of bread without any flour in it. No Christ in your sermon, sir? Then go home and never preach again until you have something worth preaching. Listen, y'all, I am a simple preacher. I essentially know one sermon, and I just re-preach that sermon 15 different ways. I'm sort of like a singer who knows the words to one song, and I'm gonna be singing this song for all eternity, and my song is Jesus. And so today, I wanna talk to you about the grace and love we have in Jesus. It's, it's a well-worn passage of scripture, Luke 15. You're probably familiar with it. Many people refer to it as the parable of the prodigal son. I like to think of it more as the, the story of the faithful father. Now, the problem with preaching a well-worn text like Luke chapter 15 is, is as I was praying through this, I was left wondering, what can I contribute to this text that hasn't already been preached? It's sort of like when somebody jumps on stage at one of these uh, singing competitions and they decide to sing a Whitney Houston song. I'm thinking like, you might as well sing something else. The song has already been sung. What are you gonna be able to sing or contribute to this song that Whitney hasn't already outsung you on. But I do hope by the help of the Holy Spirit to show you something of this grace that is exclusively found in Jesus. So hopefully you got your Bibles by now. Luke 15 is where we'll be. We're going to pick it up starting in verse 11. Scripture says this, Jesus continued, there was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, father, give me my share of the estate so he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in the whole country, and he began to be in need. How many of you have ever heard the phrase, when it rains, it pours? That's sort of what's happening to this son. Verse 15. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to the fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to himself, verse 17, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him. He was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. Now the son said to the father, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servant, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate, for this son of mine was dead and he is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come back, he replied. And your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving away for you and never disobeyed your orders. Yet you never gave me a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property with prostitutes comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him? The father responds in verse 31, My son, you were always with me. And everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. He was lost and is found. I want to talk to you guys for the next few minutes or so from this idea, grace is a party. Grace is a party. Let's pray together and invite God's presence. Lord, I do ask that you would meet us wherever it is that we're tuning in from. Father, would you increase our awareness of your presence? I pray, God, that, that your word would take root in the hearts of your people and that we would become more like Jesus, that we would rejoice in our salvation, the grace that you have given us, the grace that you have so, so uh, freely lavished upon us, Lord. May you receive the worship that is due exclusively to your name, Jesus, because you alone can and have saved us. We love you, Lord. And it's in the strong name of Jesus we pray. And everybody at home said, amen. Amen. Well, I don't know about y'all, but I lose stuff all the time, like all the time. I am constantly misplacing my car keys. It feels like a thousand times a day. I'm asking Elise if she uh, has seen my wallet. I remember when I was in college, I actually lost uh, a pretty rare copy of the Lord of the Rings trilogy by J.R.R. Tolkien. This, uh, this copy of Lord of the Rings was actually stolen from the library by my dad when he was a little boy. So when I came of age, my father uh, kindly decided to bequeath his stolen goods to me. And, uh, and uh, you would think, now my family isn't the sort of family that has uh, heirlooms or things passed down from generation to generation. So this, this copy of Lord of the Rings was essentially the closest thing I was gonna get. You would think that I would have guarded this thing with my life, right? Well, of course not. I remember the moment that I realized I lost it. I was terrified. But thankfully, a few years later, I did locate that, that copy of Lord of the Rings. And so now when JR is old enough, I can give it to him for him to lose one day. Uh, how many of you fellas can relate to this? Do you, do you have a wife or a mom who somehow, by some means of, of witchcraft and wizardry, they just seem to know uh, always where everything is, right? Uh, I, I'm, when I lose my stuff, y'all, I, I do that thing that I know y'all do, and I get frustrated. I get so upset that I start looking in irrational places, right? Like when I lose my phone, I'll look in the, in the freezer, like, like my phone decided to get up and get a snack, and, uh, and I'll do that. I'll be tearing up everything in the house until finally I come to Elise, and I'm all sweaty and upset, and I'll say, Elise, have you seen my phone? And this girl, every time, can draw me coordinates to where I lost my phone. Well, in Luke 15, Jesus tells three parables about things that are lost. A parable was a kind of biblical version of show and tell. What Jesus would do was he would use language that was easily understandable to his audience in order to drive home the point of his uh, story. We're going to focus most of our time on this third parable, uh, the parable of the prodigal son, the one in which we just read. But to, to set the stage and to get the full thrust of what Jesus is talking about, I want to I begin from the beginning of the chapter in Luke uh, 15. So starting in verse 1 and 2 of chapter 
chapter 15, we're told that the Pharisees and scribes or the religious elite of the day, they start getting a little fussy, y'all. They, they get upset because Jesus was keeping some questionable uh, company. It says that the tax collectors and sinners were drawing near to Jesus. And this is why, this is why, y'all, they decided to kill him. Because Jesus welcomed those who were an offense, who were an affront to their religious sensibilities. This is ultimately why they killed him. They were upset because in the social economy of the day, tax collectors and sinners were the worst of the worst. Sinner, it was kind of a a catch-all word for anybody who had disobeyed the law of God. It was typically attached to people who were guilty of sexual sin, like adultery or prostitution, tax collectors. These were people who would lie, cheat, and steal from their own people in order to pad their pockets a little bit. The rabbis would pronounce a house unclean if a tax collector so much stepped foot in your door. And these are the kinds of people that Jesus welcomed. In the midst of tax collectors and sinners, there you see Jesus. And, and, and he's not just welcoming, welcoming them, he's dining with them. You gotta catch this. Table fellowship was the most intimate thing you can do in ancient Near Eastern culture. And, and here's sort of what's happening. Um, this would be like if you got one of those cards in the mail, uh, those registered sex offender cards, letting you know that somebody who had committed a sexual crime had just moved into the neighborhood. Your first instinct probably wouldn't be to invite that person over for dinner. But that seems to be what Jesus is doing here. And so it's into that space that Jesus tells these three parables. He tells the story of a lost sheep. He tells the story of a lost coin. And then lastly, he tells the story of the lost son. The first thing I want you to notice about all three of these parables is Jesus doesn't deny the fact that these things are lost. They're lost as loss gets. Jesus never sidesteps sin. And in fact, each of these parables tell us something of what it means to be lost. The lost sheep indicates that when we're lost, we are in danger and we have no means to protect ourselves. The lost coin indicates that when we're lost, we are helpless and we have no means to to save ourselves. So Jesus certainly isn't condoning sin and he never makes excuses for it. But the point of these three parables is this. If you're taking notes, write this down. The point of these three parables is Jesus is saying that there is nothing so far lost that it cannot be found again. Jesus is, is emphasizing this point that there is no one so far gone that they cannot be reached with the love of God. And this is good news. This is good news for those of you who might be saying to yourself something along these lines. You may say, Shane, that sounds so good, bro, but you don't know what I've done. You don't know what my past contains. And if that's you, I want to say to you as clearly as I can from the jump that that your sin may be great, but his grace is sufficient. This is good news for those of you who have a loved one and you've been praying that they would get saved. You've been praying that they would encounter God. You've been praying, you've been fasting, you've been believing, but, but still they throw their lives away and here you are getting ready to throw in the towel. There's hope for you as well. But you don't have to take my word for it. Let me show you. Uh, Jesus goes on and tells the story of the prodigal son. One preacher calls this the, the most famous short story ever told. And in our time together, I just want to, I want to relay or I want to retell, if you will, this story in three scenes, three scenes. So we're going to take it from the top. Scene one is a scene that I'm calling give and take, give and take. Verse 11 says that there was a man, a certain man who had two sons. And this younger son knows that he's entitled to one third of his father's estate with the other two thirds going to the father's firstborn or his uh, older brother. And so he approaches his father and he demands his inheritance and he says, give me my share of the estate that is coming to me and give it to me right now. This is absolutely scandalous because what the, essentially what this younger son is saying to his dad is he says, dad, I wish you were dead because he wouldn't have received his inheritance until his father had passed away. This son says to the father, I don't care about a relationship with you. You're simply a means to an end for me, so give me my stuff now. Now here's the crazy thing. This son wasn't actually asking for anything that he wasn't one day entitled to. He didn't demand all of his father's estate. He didn't say, I want my share of the stuff and my older brother's. The younger son's problem was this. He just got the timing all wrong. How many of you know 
that the right thing at the wrong time becomes the wrong thing. Sex is good. Amen from all my married folks. But sex before you're married could be incredibly damaging and destructive. Relationships are good. But if you hurry into a relationship before you're ready, it could tear your life apart. But we say in our hearts, I want my stuff now. I want this job now. I want this house now. Give it to me now. That's the heart of this younger son. He says to the father, give me my stuff now. And just like you and I do, eventually... This younger son pays the price. Jesus said this kid gathers up all of his stuff and he journeys to a far country and before long he loses everything. The Bible doesn't give us many details here. It just says that he squandered his wealth on reckless living. You can can probably use your imagination and to make matters worse, once he's lost everything, a severe, severe famine hits that country and the only thing he can think to do is to hire himself out to one of the citizens of that country where he works among the pigs. Now keep in mind, this was a this was a Jewish young man. Uh, the Jews didn't even eat uh, pigs or pork. Now imagine uh, the sense of shame that this young man must be feeling that he's dining alongside of the pigs. And it says that he was so hungry that the pig's food started to become appetizing to him. And this is the way sin always works. It's a slow spiral, y'all. We, we dabble a little bit here. We taste a little bit there. And before long, we're enslaved to this thing and we're left asking some sort of this question. What in the world is going on and how did I get here? Some of you may be contending with that question now. You, you survey your life, you take inventory of your life and, and one small misstep has, has compounded upon itself and before long, your life is in shambles and, and like this young son, you're left asking yourself the question, how did I get here? So Jesus is making it painfully clear to us that far from God isn't anywhere you want to be. He likens it to to living in a far country where eventually you lose everything that you thought would make you happy. And we know how this goes. This, This is what always happens when you find your security or you pursue your ultimate pleasure in anything other than the father. The younger son had bought into the lie that the things of this world would ultimately satisfy the longings of his heart. But get this, no amount of, of, of money, no amount of sexual pleasure could actually tap into his greatest need. And, and, and ultimately what happens is these things that he thought were going to give him life slowly but surely began to take it away. And eventually he becomes enslaved to someone he does not know and he starts desiring things he does not want. We pastors, we have a fancy word for this. We call it rock bottom. Anybody, anybody been there before? It's in that moment when you look around and you start asking yourself, how did this happen? I heard one preacher say it this way, I'll never forget it. He said, sin always keeps you longer than you wanna stay and it will cost you more than you wanna pay. Which leads me to my second scene. The second scene I'm calling lost and found. Verse 17 says, but when he came to himself, speaking of the young man, when he came to himself, that's a beautiful phrase in your Columbus and I commend it to you because we live in a world that, conten- that conditions us to believe that, that we can't show any sign of weakness. But listen to me, weakness is the way in the kingdom. We live in an upside down kingdom where the last become first. In the kingdom of God, the lost are the ones who get found. It's the hungry in the kingdom who get fed. The, the scripture says that this young man came to himself How many of you know that sometimes you have to come to yourself before you can come to God? It's okay to show and to know that you're broken. In fact, I believe this, the the simple invitation from the Spirit of God for you might be today uh, to simply admit that you are broken, that you have need of something because because God wants to fix you, but, but he may be just waiting for you to give him all the pieces. It's in the, bro- it's in the cracks of your life. It's in the brokenness of your life that the light of the kingdom of God begins to shine through. Sometimes all it takes is for you to simply acknowledge, God, I need you. And I'm telling y'all, that's a prayer that he loves to answer. That's a prayer that he will answer every single time. This younger son knew he was in a bad place. He says, how many of my father's hired servants have food to spare? And here I am starving to death. Verse 18, he says, I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I've sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went to his father. 
But while he was still a long way off, the father saw him. You see what's happening here is the son is writing out his script and he, he's gonna go back to his daddy and he's gonna, he's gonna uh, read from this prepared script. He's gonna say, Father, I, I'm sorry I messed up. I, I'm sinned against heaven and against you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. But scripture says that while he was still a long way off, the father sees him. Now you gotta be asking yourself the question, how could the father have seen him at such a distance? There is, there is no such thing as a misplaced word in scripture. Scripture is sure to tell us that he was a long way off. How could the father have seen him at such a distance? It's because he was watching, because he was waiting. You can almost imagine every single morning while that boy was gone, that father made his cup of coffee and he walked out onto that porch. And every single morning there he stood, he was watching and he was waiting. And this is why Jesus came. Jesus said of himself in Luke 19, verse 10, he says, the son of man came to seek and to save the lost. Seek and to save. You got to get this in your Columbus. Our God is a seeking God. This was my story. When I was in high school, I ran from God as far as I could get, but he sought me out. He stepped into my sin and my story and he saved me, y'all. I did not find God. God wasn't lost. He came and he saved me while he was still a long way off. You can almost hear the echoes of Romans chapter five, verse eight, that says, while we were still sinners, while we were still a long way off, Christ died for us. While he was still a long way off, the father's heart was filled with compassion for this younger son. He runs to him. He embraces him. I I want you to imagine the emotion of this moment for me, this father's heart longing every single day to see his wayward son. And, and, And then over the horizon, He sees him and the father darts to him. He runs, he embraces and he kisses him. And this son, like I said, has this elaborate speech prepared. He probably busts it out of his pocket. He clears his throat and whatever bit of strength he has left, you can imagine the shame of his sin weighing heavily upon his shoulders. He he likely doesn't even have the the strength to look his father in the eye. He he clears his throat and he says, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I'm not worthy to be called your son. And the father says, quick, my boy is home. He says, son, I don't need all that. I just need you. He says, go get him a robe because I'm going to cover all of his shame. He says, go get the best ring and put it on his finger. A ring would have signified for this son what family and the worth of this family that he comes from. He says, son, I want to remind you of who you are. Go get that ring and put it on his finger. And he says, get his best dancing shoes, y'all, because we are going to dance all night long. This is the grace that God has for you and I. And grace is a party. You see, our God is a seeking God and our God is a dancing God. Over and over again, scripture makes clear that God rejoices when sinners come to repentance. In fact, this is the point of the first two parables uh, in Luke chapter 15. When the shepherd finds his lost sheep, he runs and tells all his homies, he says, fellas, my sheep is back. Come and party with me. When the woman finds her coin, she gathers all her neighbors and she says, rejoice. Rejoice with me, I have found my lost coin. And Jesus says, this is the picture of what happens in heaven. He says, the heavens break out in an uproarious party whenever a sinner comes to repentance. And here's why I tell you all that. I know I'm talking to at least a few of you who maybe would say of yourself, Shane, there's not much about me worth celebrating. You know, my past is full of mistakes that I wish I could take back. Or perhaps you, you feel like you're not worth celebrating because you or, or your parents uh, have set an impossible standard for you and try as you might, you always feel like you're constantly left falling short. Or perhaps you're the mother who labors so lovingly for your family and uh, all of that hard work and, and, and everything that you do uh, seems to go unnoticed. You may be saying to yourself, Shane, there isn't much worth celebrating about me If I were to take inventory of my life, there honestly isn't much to write home about. And to you, I wanna wanna share this story with you. I, uh, I went to the mighty Beechcroft High School, the finest institution in Columbus. I'm a proud Columbus City graduate. And uh, after I graduated, I actually went back and coached uh, high school soccer, believe it or not. And there was one young man on my team whose name was Bubakari. And uh, it was a trip, y'all, because uh, his older brother, who was also on the team, was named Bubakari. And his younger brother was named, you're never gonna guess it, 
Bubakari. And so the only way that I could identify him amongst his brothers what I would call, as I was call, would call him by his uh, middle initial. And so, and so we called him Kay. Kay uh, and his family were refugees from a war-torn, war-torn country in West Africa. Kay, along with his seven siblings, lived in a two-bedroom apartment here in Columbus. And one day after practice, uh, Kay let us know that it was his 18th birthday. And so I, I'm pumped for Kay. I'm like, Kay, this is a big day, man. You're, you're stepping into manhood. I'm sure you got a big party planned. You and your family, it's going to be awesome, Kay. And uh, Kay actually said, no, no, coach. We, uh, we don't do parties in my family. And I actually found out that day that uh, for 18 years of his life, Kay had never had a birthday party. And my heart broke for this young man because Kay was an exceptional young man. He was a straight-A student working hard to get a scholarship. Uh, He was an outstanding soccer player. He actually led us to the City League title that year. Um, And on top of all that, he worked a full-time job at Dunkin' Donuts just to keep his family financially afloat. And this young man had never been celebrated before. And so I after practice, I got with a few other guys on the team and we went to Kroger and we bought the biggest sheet cake we could find. And we bought every single candle in the store, y'all. And, and we covered that cake and candles and we went to Kay's apartment complex and we threw my man his first birthday party right there in that apartment complex. You may be thinking to yourself, Shane, there's nothing to celebrate about me. And I want to keep it real with you. You might be right. But when you come to Jesus... He has this miraculous way of making ugly things beautiful. Jesus celebrates you because he makes all things new. The Pharisees, remember, they were grumbling because sinners were coming to Jesus, but the heavens rejoice when sinners come to Jesus. And this would have been the perfect place to end the story. But unfortunately, it doesn't end there. This takes me to my third scene, scene that I'm calling what's mine is yours. That would have been the best place for a happily ever after. But, but scene three, while all this celebrating is going on, you know, the father is slaughtering the fat and calf. All the servants are, are out there partying as well. Jesus takes us to the heart of the older brother. Verse 25 says that while the older brother was out in the field, he heard all this music and dancing. And at this point, he has no idea yet that the younger brother has gone home. For all he knows, his dad's in the house having some sort of midlife crisis, dancing to Beyonce in there. And so he asks one of the servants, he says, what's, what's going on with dad? And the servant responds to him, your younger brother is back. And so we are about to party. The servant probably expected to be, to be met with excitement from the older brother. But, but instead, the Bible says that, that the, the older brother responded indignantly. He was, he was full of anger and he refused to join the party. And so again, the father pursues the older brother. This is the way the father always works. He's always the one in hot pursuit of us. And he pleads with the older brother. He says, come inside, join the party. Your brother is home. But the, the older brother refuses. And he says, He essentially says this. He says, listen, man, I've been here the entire time. I have kept every single rule and you never saw fit to throw a party for me. But this younger brother who has wasted your money on prostitutes and reckless living, he he wanders his way home and you're gonna party for him? In essence, the older brother is asking this question that many of you might be asking of yourself today. The, The older brother is asking, what about me? What about me? Ricky Gervais, uh, he's a comedian. He's the creator of The Office. He said that he could never bring himself to believe in God because he never understood redemption. He said that he always found himself siding with the older son, saying, why does he get all of the attention? And it's at this point in the story uh, when everybody in the crowd starts to lose their minds because uh, it's sort of like what happens when you watch The Sixth Sense for the first time and you find out that old boy's been dead the entire movie, right? I'm sorry if you haven't seen it before. Spoiler alert, it's like 20 years old. But Jesus' original audience at this point, they're all looking around at themselves like, dang it, I did not see that coming. Because Jesus is telling us here that there's two ways to be lost. It's not only that the wandering and wayward are lost. Jesus is telling us here that it's just as likely and just as lethal for you to keep all the rules and to stay home and still miss out on intimacy with the father. You see, the older son's mistake 
was that he spent his whole life trying to earn what was being afforded to him for free. He was more concerned with keeping the rules than he was with knowing the father. But I want you to notice, I need you to hear the tenderness in the father's response. He says, son, you were always with me and all that I have is yours. You know, I think about my two little boys. You know, no Shane Huey sermon is complete without uh, a quick story about my, my boys. But I think about my two little boys and I, I think often about what I want them to know about me. I want them to know that, that I love them. I want them to know that I'm proud of them. I remember when, when my first son, JR, was born and they, they placed him into my arms and I was so pumped, y'all. Like I, I dreamed about being a father. And so here I am with my little boy. I start Jericho marching around this hospital like I'm speaking in tongues, shouting for joy. And, and I remember I turned to this little boy and the only thing that I can think to say to him over and over again was, JR, I am so proud of you. I am so proud of you. And any parent of a a little one knows that he actually contributed very little to my family. He wasn't adding to the bottom line, right? It took a lot of work and money to take care of this little boy. But that didn't matter to me because I wanted him to know that I loved him and I was proud of him. Not because of what he does, but simply because of who he is. I want my boys to know that I love them. I want them to know that I'm proud of them. I want them to know that I will exhaust all of my means to make sure that they are cared for, that they are protected. And now as they grow up, there will be a thousand times when I miss that ideal. But on the few occasions that I actually follow through, I hope that they know, that they know, that they know, that regardless of what they do, their daddy loves them. Always less than they deserve, but somehow more than they could ever imagine. You see, this is the point of the gospel. Christianity isn't primarily about what you do and don't do. It's all about what Jesus Christ has done for you. I want you to know today that your heavenly father always follows through, always follows through. Just a few chapters earlier, I'm landing the plane and I'm gonna close with this. Just a few chapters earlier in uh, Luke chapter 12, Jesus says, he says, fear not little flock for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. It's his good pleasure. The father will not withhold any good thing from those he loves. Maybe you're in here this morning and you feel a little bit like the older son. You have been a good moral person. You have uh, kept all the rules. You're so spiritual that you tune in not just at 9 a.m. but at 1032, right? You've done all that you can to be a good person. You don't disobey, but somehow you still feel distant from the heart of the father. And it's funny how that happens, right? It, 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 it never happens all at once. Never have I encountered the person who woke up one morning and said, you know what, I'm tired of keeping all these rules. Uh, I, I'm, I'm gonna throw in the towel and, and cash all my chips in and I'm, I'm walking away. It's usually, most often, a slow drift. And before long, you've missed out on the Father's heart. You've, you, there's this vacancy in your heart, this longing and desire for intimacy And you've forgotten about relationship. I imagine it being more of a slow drift for many of you today. And somewhere along the way, in the midst of all your striving, you've missed out on this simple reality that God welcomes you and he wants to know you and he longs to be with you. This is what it means to be in living relationship with a living God. Let me ask you a question. Do you feel like God owes you? Do you feel like God has forgotten about you? Do you feel like you have to fight to earn his attention? I need you to know this, Vineyard Columbus, that that when Jesus died on the cross, he once and for all earned the ear of the Father for you. You don't have to fight for his attention. All of the Father's attention, all of his affection, all of his delight is wrapped up in you. If that's you, I want to remind you that Jesus Christ died so that all that he had could become yours. The son of God was treated like a rebel on the cross so that us rebels could be called sons and daughters of God. Perhaps you maybe identify a little bit more with the the younger son and you've been wasting your life away on on reckless living. I want you to know again that uh, there's nothing you can do to make your father love you any less. That when when you join yourself to Jesus by faith, Every sin, past, present, and future is washed clean by the blood of Jesus. Jesus is not waiting on a future version of you. 
the version of you that cleans yourself up and stop makes, stops making mistakes. Jesus welcomes you just as you are right now. And he's waiting on you with an embrace. That's what grace is, Vineyard Columbus. So I want to pray into that uh, for us just as we close. Father, we thank you for your grace. Make your grace real to us, whether we're a little like the younger son and we're running from you right now, or perhaps we're a little like the older son. And although we're keeping all the rules, we feel a lack of intimacy with you. Would you meet us wherever we are with your grace? You said in your word in the book of James that you give more grace as if the grace you've given isn't already sufficient enough, you give more. Help us to know today that grace isn't a concept or some mystical force, that grace is a person and his name is Jesus. Jesus, we're returning to you just as we are, holding on to the promise that when we do, you make all things new. We love you, Lord. We thank you for your grace. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen.
Well, before we close our time together, I just wanna take just a quick moment and pray a closing benediction, a blessing over each of you. So take a second and do whatever you need to do to center yourself before the Lord. That might be kind of hard for you right now. Maybe you have kids running around screaming or Maybe you're in a car or something that might distract you, but whatever you need to do to open yourself up to the Lord's voice as we pray together, would you do that now? And I do pray for each of you that is listening to me right now, that you would be filled with God's presence this week, that you would feel his nearness, and I pray for those of you that are listening, that as Pastor Shane was preaching, you thought to yourself, I am lost. And maybe that's because you know you're a long way off, or maybe like Pastor Shane was saying, you've been following all the rules, but you've realized that you're utterly disconnected from the Lord right now. And for those of you that that might apply to, I pray that this week in particular, that you would have an experience of the reality that our God is a grace-filled, merciful God who seeks us out time and time again, no matter how far we've gone. Pray that you would know that reality this week of a loving father who comes to meet you right where you are. Go with God's grace and his peace in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you so much for being with us this weekend. And do not forget, later this week, in just a few days, we are hosting our watch night service. It's gonna be online this year. It's gonna be at 7 p.m. and 11 p.m. featuring a virtual choir and Pastor Charles Montgomery. You do not want to miss it. Oh, yes. And so we hope to see you next week. And also know this, for the next three weeks, we're going to be celebrating our senior leadership uh, transition. It is going to be incredible. Uh, you do not want to miss out on it. We are really looking forward to this. On January 3rd, Eric and I are going to be teaching Vision for the Future. On the 10th, we are welcoming Bishop Timothy Clark from First Church to preach a sermon for Rich and Marley Nathan called honoring a leadership legacy. It's gonna be an amazing celebration of their years of service. And then on the 17th, Rich will preach a commissioning message for Eric and I. And wow, that is it. We cannot wait. Happy New Year. This is the last time, right. so we love you. See you next year. Yep. Thank you.